All right. Okay, welcome everybody to today's webinar, Advancing Vehicle Electrification with System Simulation. My name is Swati Thiagi. I'm the Marketing Manager here at Modelon and I'll be your host for today. Um, today we have a very special webinar because we have guest presenters Remac presenting their story today. Um, Modelon is very proud to partner with Remac and we're excited for you to hear about their system simulation journey. For presenters at this webinar, we have Kuno Hervatinic, who is the Head of Control and Simulation at Remec Technology. And we also have Eric Derling, who is a Simulation Engineer here at Modelon. Now, before we get started, just a few options that everybody has as attendees. Um, the first option being the chat feature. Um, the chat feature allows you to chat live with attendees that are also viewing this webinar. Um, you can also chat with Modelon through the chat feature. The second feature is the raise hand feature. So when we do get to the Q&A portion, um, if you would like to ask your questions to Kruno and Eric directly, um, click the raise hand feature and that will indicate to me that I should unmute your mic. Um, and that way you can speak to either of them live. And then we also have the Q&A feature. So throughout the webinar, if you do have questions, um, about what Kruno or Eric are presenting or follow-up questions, I would put it into the Q&A box. Um, this gives us a nice list of questions that we need to address during the Q&A sections. And if we don't get to your question at that time, um, somebody from Modelon or Remac would be able to follow up with you offline. Now, as far as agenda, um, the main the main point of our presentation will be Remax Journey of System Simulation, which will be presented by Kruno. Uh, this will be followed by a 10 minute Q&A with Kruno, um, which will then be followed by a short demo presented by Eric Derling on the Remax components that will be included in Modelon's electrification library, um, which will then finally be ended by a five minute Q&A with Eric and Kruno. So, with all this being said, I'm happy to pass over the mic to Kruno. Um, Kruno, you have the floor. Okay, thank you. So, hello, I'm Kruno Hrvatinic. I'm Head of Control and Simulation at Trimac Automobili. I lead a department of around 20 people, and I'm also the technical lead for battery estimation algorithms and the Remas torque vectoring system. My de department consists of two teams. We have the control engineering team, which builds control and estimation algorithms for Remax vehicles and components. And we have the simulation team, which composes and runs simulations, both 3D simulations, that means FEM and CFD, as well as 1D simulations. And uh, during this webinar, I'll be focusing exclusively on our work on 1D simulation. Now, let me introduce the company Remax Automobili. Uh, Rimac was founded in 2009 when our CEO Mate Rimac converted his old BMW E30 into an electric race car and we've been making electric vehicles ever since. We've grown to be a major force in electric vehicles worldwide, shown by our uh, how many people we have. We have 500 people, nearly half of those are employed in R&D. We've developed, produced and delivered the world's fastest electric supercar. We're a tier one supplier for 10 global automotive OEMs. We've drawn 140 million euros in investment, which is really an unprecedented amount for a Croatian company. And we've been globally and locally recognized as a great business and an amazing place to work in. But what exactly do we do? So two things basically. We make electric hypercars, vehicles with extreme performance, cutting edge features, and just a touch of luxury. And we make electric vehicle components, which power our hypercars, but also drive electrification with our OEM partners. Uh, our cars are the concept one, which is our original hypercar. It made its debut at the 2011 Frankfurt International Auto Show, and it can do 0 to 100 kilometers per hour in 2.5 seconds with a top speed of 355 kilometers per hour and a range of 350 kilometers on a single charge. We've built and sold eight of these cars to customers worldwide. We are currently in the end stages of developing the Remax C2, which is our next generation hypercar. This car debuted at the 2018 Geneva International Auto Show and is slated for start of production in 2020. It exceeds our original model in every way. It boasts a staggering 1.85 0 to 100 kilometers uh, time, 
a top speed of 412 kilometers per hour and an enormous 650 kilometers maximum range. All of this is possible because Rima's technology designs and builds the components that our hypercars need to achieve this level of performance. We've worked with many automotive OEMs to build high power vehicles, and we're appreciated for our flexibility and our ability to deliver what the customer requires. And this is because we built and developed nearly every part of the electric vehicle in-house. But I'm going to focus here on our battery packs and on our drivetrain, since this is where modeling and simulation can really shine. Uh, Rima's technology provides full powertrain systems to OEMs, up to the level of performance found in Rima's hypercars. We use our cars to show the world what can be done and offer our components and services to customers who want to make more powerful electric vehicles. When building battery packs, we adapt to our customers' requirements, and our solutions range from large high-capacity packs for powerful road cars to an exceptionally dense and high power pack, for, the, for example, for the hybrid Koenigsegg Regera. Such packs come with specific problems, in particular heat. High power means high heat generation, and bespoke means there is very little space available. And Rematz offers innovative cooling solutions, which, which keep the battery at the optimal temperature without sacrificing power or capacity. We build the battery electronics and software as well. Uh, the low voltage components, such as the battery management system, and the high voltage components that distribute power between the high voltage consumers are also products of Rematz technology. In addition to this, our battery packs satisfy homologation requirements for various markets, whatever our customer requires, and our software is ISO 26262 compliant. We develop our own drivetrain components. This means inverters, motors, and gearboxes. As an example, our Rematz PM700 electric motor is designed for the highest power to weight ratio, with very high peak efficiency. And since it's our own design, we can adapt it to fit the project. For example, what we've done is we fit two motors into one casing which saves on space and which simplifies cooling. Well, we've done a lot, but our goal now is to increase volume. We have proven that we can build small quantities of high performance components, but we must become bigger and faster if we want to satisfy the requirements of medium-sized production runs for large manufacturers. We want to keep the quality our customers have come to expect, so we need to find a way to do things faster. So we want to do more, we're rapidly expanding, we're taking on new projects, we're starting internal development on new types of components, and we have always wanted to cover every aspect of electrical vehicles. We want to achieve all of these goals as quickly as possible. And it was clear to us very early on that this growth would not go as fast as we'd like if we, everything were done through engineering experience and physical prototype testing. This is why we started searching for a flexible and powerful simulation solution that would cover our current needs as well as our unknown future needs. So we started formal evaluation of physical system simulation platforms in early 2018. And at the time, we had a few engineers doing 1D simplified simulations using whatever they could get their hands on. This means MATLAB, Excel, Python, pen and paper. We did things manually. We coded models from scratch. We relied on the engineer's training and their expertise. And this meant that we really couldn't do more complex things. We were predicting simple vehicle physics like acceleration and power, thermal losses for the powertrain, and vehicle range, and this was enough for that stage of our development. We did this through simple methods that gave us conservative and steady state estimates. In the early projects, this was okay, but we knew that in the future we would need more. And we weren't really satisfied with what we were doing because since everyone did their own thing, using their own tool, it was difficult to reuse the work done for, uh, for previous projects we would have needed to, uh, to write our own simulation framework, and this made no sense because there are perfectly good frameworks out there already. Uh, the whole process was too time consuming, and it required engineers who knew exactly what they were doing. This was not scalable to more projects in a short amount of time. We needed a way to transfer knowledge more quickly. The tools that we were using did nothing to help the engineers accomplish knowledge transfer. They just enabled them to work well. And we were limited in what we could do which links to the previous point, which uh, means if we couldn't reuse work, we couldn't build upon previous work. Mostly this was an issue for reduced stored or thermal fluid models, but more complex chassis and powertrain models were also impossible to do just through hand coding. And we were limited in how we could do it. In particular, it was difficult to do proper dynamic simulations since we'd need to arrange all of the equations by hand. So we mostly stuck to steady state and average summary measures of performance. In short, we couldn't reuse old work. The tools worked well only in experienced engineers' hands, and we couldn't do all the things that we wanted. 
So we stopped, we took stock, and we figured out what our simulation platform should look like. And we identified a few uh, key things. So first of all, the simulation platform should support us in early stage simulations before we have a prototype. If there's a new component we're building, and it usually is a new component, we can get information about the performance of the component in any other way. We should be able to put together various design concepts and simulations so that we can try out more variations and spot potential problems before we need to spend time and money on drawing and manufacturing. The ideal scenario here is getting it right the first time, which means making a prototype which works well. We needed our platform to be made out of parts which we can reuse to put together a simulation quickly. We also needed the parts to work at different levels of abstraction, for example, for a battery pack. We can model a battery pack down to the individual cell, cell but this is hardly necessary if all you need is a general idea of what the maximum power is, what the, mag what the heat generation is. So our platform should contain components that are reusable, scalable, and quick to use. We wanted our components to simplify complicated physics the way an expert in that physical domain would do it. We wanted engineering best practices to be implemented inside the components immediately so that the platform can start us off closer to the best way of doing things. This would help us run reduced order simulations in all the physical domains where we aren't yet experts. For example, we wanted thermal fluid models that we could parameterize through channel geometry because we have CAD, but we, are not, we were not experienced enough to get, uh, to get a full pressure flow model from just geometry. However, in domains where we are experts, we didn't want to be limited by what the software supplier chooses to implement. If the platform lacks a model that we need, we wanted to be able to add that model to the platform, um, platform ourselves. And we're able to do this because we're structured the way they are. Uh, you might have noticed that I'm head of simulation and control engineering. That's part of the same department because control engineering needs models in their raw form as mathematical equations to do proper, proper control. And since we already have the models and know how to use them, it's not a problem to write them down in a format that the platform understands. However, the platform needs to allow this. It needs to be built with this in mind. So, we found a solution to nearly all of our concerns in Modelica. We, uh, through our research in the field of vehicle dynamics, we found that many authors were using something called the Vehicle Dynamics Library for multi-body simulations. And that library was implemented in a modeling language called Modelica. And we started using it through the open Modelica simulation environment where we found the general purpose tool for any sort of simulation we wanted. So Modelica is used by defining models, then connecting them into larger systems. We could build component models and reuse them in many different simulations. Uh, we could use them at different levels of abstraction and connecting them together was simple and it was quick. The engineer did not need to manually figure out how exactly the equations needed to be arranged. But this satisfied our need for fast reusability and for scalability. And since Modelica is an open platform, it's accessible to anyone, and all the features of the language are clearly described in books and manuals. And this satisfied our need to be able to build a component model ourselves at any level of complexity that we wanted. And I should also mention, mention a related open standard, which works well with Modelica and which we found great use for. Uh, use for. So the functional mockup interface standard specifies a way to share models between different vendors' tools. It's well supported in many commercial simulation tools, and it's an extremely useful, useful feature that we never knew we wanted. I'll talk a little bit about that later. So Open Modelica and Modelica itself, its base library, uh, were lacking in a few key aspects, and they weren't really the complete solution that we wanted. There weren't a lot of components available here in the domains that we were, we were most interested in, vehicle dynamics, thermopolitics, and powertrain modeling. We could build these, but we would need to build them from scratch. That would take a lot of time, and we wanted to just hit the ground running and uh, get, uh, get, uh, get our team functional immediately. And the avail available components were hard to use, and they were poorly, poorly documented. Although the language was understandable, the libraries that helped us use the language, we couldn't really understand how to, how to work with them. And we didn't have anyone to reach out for help. So we needed a software supplier here who had the components that we needed and who could support us as we started working with Modelica. Going back to Vehicle Dynamics Library, we were aware of Modelon because they are, the, they are the supplier of Vehicle Dynamics Library, so it was natural for us to request a trial software to evaluate everything that Modelon could provide. So in Remats, we preferred to do evaluation through using the product for a practical daily task. 
to replicate how we'd actually use the product. So this evaluation is not guided by the supplier. A remote engineer does the work using the software and asks for support when they feel it's necessary. And with Model 1 starting, the evaluation was very quick and very smooth. Within a day or two of Freemats requesting a trial, Model 1 provided us enough licenses to cover all of our engineers for a month of evaluation. Our engineers could start working right away. And as we worked, we sent questions to Model 1's support team. These questions were also answered within a day or two, but what really impressed us was the completeness of the answer. We got an explanation of why the problem was happening, what the solution is, and some best practices advice to prevent the problem in the future. This gave us a lot of confidence that Model 1 could support us as we adapt to their tools. In addition, Model 1 was able to provide, some, uh, provide support outside of just their tools. See, a key part of the simulation package is the tool used to connect, compile, and simulate the models. Model 1 doesn't provide this tool, and we had to get it from another supplier. But in cases where we had a problem with our simulation tool, Model 1 was willing and able to provide excellent advice and solutions. We had honestly expected to be bounced to another supplier, but Model 1 was committed to helping us solve our problem. So after comparing Model 1's offering with other suppliers and taking into account the responsiveness of, of Model 1 during the evaluation, we decided to go ahead with Model 1 libraries as the components that power our simulation platform. But why exactly? So two things. Firstly, Model 1's li libraries are really good. And secondly, we could work with Model 1 as partners, not just as customer and supplier. So Model 1 has libraries that cover every physical domain that's of interest to an electric vehicle manufacturer. For simulating the chassis and suspension of a car on the road, Model 1 offers a vehicle dynamics library. For simulating the brake system and the gearbox shifting mechanism, Model 1 offers the hydraulics library. And for simulating the various cooling systems in the vehicle, there's the liquid cooling library. Recently, for electrical vehicle powertrains, there is now the electrification library. These libraries contain many more components than competing libraries, and they come in different levels of complexity. For example, we wanted to simulate the hydraulic system which powers our gearbox. The system consists of pistons, valves, pump, and the hydraulic accumulator. Using the hydraulics library, we could simulate the exact type of valve we needed. And in other libraries that we tried, we could only find approximations. For the hydraulic accumulator, the Model 1 offered a more complex physical model than competitors. And it turned out that we needed this kind of more complex physical model to capture the pressure dynamics, because our accumulator heated up during use. And Model 1's model gave us an excellent starting point. With a few simple modifications using the model and la uh, the modelica language, we could achieve our desired behavior. And all these libraries work separately, but they're built to work together. And to demonstrate this, uh, let's take a look at where we use the various libraries inside Remits. So, uh, for example, if we're interested in uh, simulating the electrical, be uh, electrical behavior of the battery, we can use the electrification library by itself to simulate it. However, we can also model the cooling system of a battery pack using liquid cooling and simulate it separately from the electrical part. And when we want to see how the battery performs under a load cycle, we connect these two models together to form a complete model of the battery pack. Now that we have a component model of the battery pack, we can use it elsewhere. If we want to see if our vehicle can run a track without the battery overheating, we can put the component model into a vehicle model built through vehicle dynamics. There we can assign a speed profile to a virtual driver model. And if we're interested in how our powertrain performs thermally, we can use the motor and inverter models plug them inside the vehicle dynamics model as well. Each of these components model I've mentioned here is built by a different team. So the chassis model team doesn't build the battery model and the battery uh, team doesn't build the chassis. However, it's very clear where the battery model should be placed inside the chassis model. So making a handoff of models between teams is simple to do. You'll see a bit of this in the live demo later on. And the last thing I have to mention is the FMI integration. So Model 1's libraries are built on top of open standards, and we can easily make functional mock-up units of any models built using those libraries to share models with other simulation tools. These FMUs, functional mock-up units, can be used by as many engineers as we like for as long as we like without additional licensing costs. For example, for our control engineers who need a plant model inside Simulink, they can directly plug in an FMU without needing any licenses other than base, MATLAB, or Simulink to do their job. So we can do now a lot of things like this integration into Simulink, things that we couldn't really do before. A few more examples are for the battery. We can now easily test out different mathematical formulations of electrical and thermal cell models drawn directly from new research. We take an experiment that comes standard with Model 1's libraries, 
and we replace a small part of it with our new model from research. This is quick to do because Modlon's library structure makes it very clear which part needs to be replaced. And once we've done this once, we can reuse our new model as a component in new, in new future simulations. We can now also try out many more options in simulation. We can try out different cooling concepts, different cells, different cell series parallel configurations, uh, and the library speed up the work of experienced engineers so they can do what they used to be able to do, but more of that in the same amount of time. The libraries also allow inexperienced engineers to learn while doing and be become useful really quickly. We can now model cooling systems from flexible pipes to cooling plates through, ge through their geometry. And although we could already do this through CFD, but using the liquid cooling library, we can run quicker dynamic simulations and connect the cooling system to other components. For example, we can connect the pump, expansion tanks, and heat sources to our cooling system model. It's also now significantly easier to add more detail to a thermal model. For example, where we used to model a motor as one thermal mass, now we can easily split it into the casing, the windings, and the rotor. We can model each individual cell of a battery pack just by swapping out a part of a model, and we don't need to change much if we want to add or remove some cells. Connecting different types of, types of physics is now also easily possible. For example, we can take our drive cycles, which are expressed in vehicle speed, and we can generate dynamic predictions of powertrain temperature. We can see how the battery cells heat up, how the motor and the inverter heat up, and how the heat is conducted away by air going past the heat exchanger at the appropriate speed. Another example is using FMI, but here to add more physics to specialized tools. For example, we use IPG CarMaker, and if we want to add thermal models to the battery pack, we can use FMI to do that. Now, I hope this presentation shows that Modlon and Rimats are working well together. And uh, the reason for this is because we're sort, we're sort of in a partner relationship. Electrification library was in development when we decided on Modlon as a supplier. And here we really found an opportunity to collaborate. And in conversations during the trial period, we figured out that there could be great benefits to include Rimats in the development process of electrification. Since Remats is already actively developing powertrain components, we could share our experience and our requirements with Modelon. This could inform decisions on which components should be included inside the library and which use cases these components should cover. These components are expertly crafted by Modelon and used by both Remats and other users of the library. And the benefits, as we see it, are Modelon's product is larger, it has more models, it covers more use cases. And for the Remats side, we get bug-free and performant models that we would be hard-pressed to create ourselves. We could also share some of the models that Remus had developed in-house to help other users of electrification library get a head start on powertrain modeling. And here, I'd like to announce the Remus models, which will be available in the next version of electrification library. You'll be able to see the models and ask questions after the live demo, but let me just give you a quick overview. So we plan to provide a Remus cell experiment containing a validated model of a lithium-ion cell, along with an experiment which drives that cell through a power cycle. We also plan to provide a Remus module experiment, showing how the cell model can be scaled up to a pack model. So for the cell model, the cell model is a lithium-ion cell in 21700 format. It contains a validated electrical model and the thermal model, which correctly captures the non-homogeneous conduction through the cell. Along with the cell, we provide the data that we use to validate it. This includes the electrical data, but it also includes the thermal data. The cell experiment is where the validation setup is recreated. And this is the model we at Remats use when we test a new cell of the same format to predict how it will behave under test conditions and ensure that the test can be successfully completed. This experiment uses the Remats cell model and connects it to a model of our climate chamber where convective losses cool the battery. The module experiment shows how the cell model can be scaled up to an entire battery pack. And this experiment contains a new feature of electrification 1.2, which is a power cycle. Eric will tell you a bit more about that later on. The experiment also contains the battery cooling system, which shows how different types of physics can be connected through model on libraries. And now I'd like to take some questions. So Swati, could you? Thanks, Kuno. So yes, now it is time for questions from the audience. Again, um, if you have any questions that you'd like to send over Kuno's way, feel free to put it in that Q&A box at the bottom. Um, and if you'd like to speak to him live, uh, just click that raise hand 
button and that'll indicate to me that I should just unmute your mic so you can ask your question. So um, I'll give a few minutes for you guys to enter any questions you may have. Um, but till then, Kruno, I did have a question. Um, how long did it take for your team to become productive with Medelka and the model uh, and the model on libraries? I think I think you're on mute. <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, I I must say I have some problems with my audio. If you could give me just a minute to to uh, to figure that out. No worries. Okay, things things seem to be fine now. So your question was, how long did it take us to get productive with model and libraries, right? Yes. Uh, okay, so it took us a few months. So for every engineer, there is sort of a, a running in period where, where they get acquainted with the model and libraries. And this process is a few weeks before they, they can start using the libraries, but it takes a while to master. So we say about a month. About a month, great. Um, and we also have another question from, uh, uh, Kyu Yoon Son, um, the question is, what is your experience with using FMI, FMU for simulant controllers? Uh, it's actually great. So mostly what we're using is chassis models in, uh, built through uh, the vehicle dynamics library. And what we're using them for is advanced uh, control. So we're using predictive control. That's the torque vectoring system that we're developing for the, for the C2. Uh, and although the models are slow, the integration is very smooth. And as I said, you don't need to, to have any additional tools. Our, uh, our workflow used to involve many different tools coupled together. But right now, our engineers are using Simulink only and using FMUs uh, to provide the plant model. Thanks. Um, now we also have a question from uh, Tufan Samal who is asking a question live. So, Dufan, I'm going to unmute your mic. Uh, you should be unmuted now. So if you'd like to test your audio real quick. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Um, yeah, my question is, uh, the, uh, in the, uh, in recently they showed a video uh, explanation for the cell uh, life cycle testing. So uh, do we need a hardware setup to do that testing? Um, Hello. Yes, you you do need a a better battery cycle to do a life cycle testing to run the battery down. Uh, it's depending on what sort of uh, what sort of uh, life cycle testing you would like to do. But yeah, you'd need to test uh, a battery cycle. Is that what your question was? Uh, suppose I have a data sheet of a battery like LG HG2. Uh, so data cell itself tells all the properties and chemical composition and thermal properties of that uh, battery. So uh, yeah. is it possible to, uh, on a large scale, where I am using multiple cells in parallel and series, and uh, I want to check the drive cycle with all the thermal analysis I have. So based on that, do I need to do the test setup hardware wise or only with software it's possible? Um, it's possible to do that set uh, that test setup in software if you have a well validated cell model and if you have a well validated battery uh, battery pack model. So uh, okay. yes, it is possible if you trust your model enough. Okay, thank you. That's my question. Thank you, Tufan. I will mute your mic again. Um, we have a few other questions. So Arvind Brabha um, asked, how accurate were the results obtained from models created using model on libraries with lab tests? Uh, well, for the cell models in the electrification library 1.2, you'll be able to see for yourselves, uh, but quite accurate. So we are within a few uh, millivolts in, in voltage. Thermally, it really depends on how well we can model the environment, but in our uh, battery uh, in our battery test setup that's included, we're within a few degrees. Uh, again, for, for the battery cell, it's a question of where exactly you're measuring. We're measuring on the surface of the, of the cell, and there the models match up very well. Thanks for your question, Arvind. Um, Chad Baker asks, 
is Kuno running models on laptop, desktop, HPC server, or cloud? Okay, so it depends on which engineer you ask. Uh, inside the simulation department, we are using high-powered PCs. So uh, this is a desktop workstation. We are not running models on the cloud uh, at all. Uh, we are you, we have tried using FMUs uh, in in the cloud, so as a distributed sort of computing platform, but that's reserved for specific cases where we want to test different configurations uh, in parallel. Uh, we are also our engineers, the control engineers, are mostly using laptops because they need to be mobile when they need to be on the track. Uh, and here the models were run more slowly. It's a slower machine, but they run acceptably uh, fast for us to do our work. Thanks for your question, Chad. Um, we have another one from Siddharth Arun Kumar. Um, on the multi-body dynamic side, have you used other tools for, for prediction and how does model on compare to those? For example, GT perhaps? Uh, we have no experience with GT. We have experience with some uh, Altair tools. We've had some, uh, some experience with IPG CarMaker, which we're still using, but that, that's not really a multi-body tool. Some of our engineers have experience with Atoms. Uh, and in general, we are quite satisfied with vehicle dynamics libraries for all of our use cases. Uh, it's, it's a trade-off, of course but we really appreciate how vehicle dynamics library is able to smoothly integrate with different types of physics. This is really important for us uh, since we're developing electrical powertrains. We're interested in how everything works together. And here, the ability of, mod um, of uh, Modelica to connect different physics together is more valuable than any potential gain in accuracy that we could get from, from other tools, as small as that gain might be. Thank you, Karina, and thanks, Siddharth, for the question. We have one more question. Um, do you work with power electronics models like inverter and motor models to test the inverter control software? Um, and then follow-up question, do you use FPGAs um, to do real-time uh, hardware in the loop simulation? Uh, okay, so we do run tests on, uh, on inverter hardware. So since we produce our own inverter, and the hardware for it and the software for it, we need a way to test our control algorithms. This is one of the things that control uh, engineering does. And we do use simulations uh, in which we predict the thermal uh, losses, in which we predict also the electrical uh, behavior of, uh, of the system. So the second part of the question is, do we use FPGAs for, uh, for simulation? We use FPGAs inside our hardware because we need the inverter to switch at a very high frequency and we need the control to happen very fast, but we don't use it for, for hardware in uh, for hardware load testing. We don't deploy our models to the FPGA if, uh, if that was the question. I believe so. Um, Georgian, if, you, if that didn't answer your question, feel free to ask another follow-up question, but um, mm -hmm. otherwise we'll move on to the next question. Um, Ali Reza Masum asks, when you speak about scale up of Modelka language, how much ODE can it handle? Uh, okay, how many ordinary differential equations? And numerically, I can't really give you a number here. It can, it can handle a full multi-body uh, simulation model and that runs slower than real time. It can handle reduced order models which do run in real time. But just to give you a number, I, I, I couldn't really, we're, I, I don't know. Uh, here, maybe it would be best if you contacted us uh, after the presentation and I could give you some more details. Thanks, Karina. Thanks, Ali Reza. Um, we have one more question. How to, con um, the question is how to control battery temperatures in different climatic zones. Um, I'm not entirely sure what you mean by different climatic zones. So uh, if we're talking about in different environmental temperatures, so in different regions of the world, uh, there's a, uh, there are systems that connect the air conditioning system inside the battery to, to super cool the, flu the fluid coolant going through the battery. Uh, and there's conventional liquid cooling. There are different ways to implement the cooling system inside the battery. So submerged cooling or just cooling plate cooling or more innovative methods. 
um, how to control, if you're asking how to control the temperature in different parts of a battery pack, that's just by design of the cooling system. Active control here would be difficult, especially for us, since it would drive the, the dimensions and the weight of the pack way up. And that's sort of always a no-no when you're working with high power vehicles. Thanks, Kurnow. Um, and then one last final question before we move on to the demo. Kurnow, how easy is it for your R&D teams of specialized domains to collaborate on and share the same models versus before? So uh, before we did very little collaboration because uh, each, each engineer had their own task to do, they did it, and then the model they built was sort of discarded. Uh, and it was it would have been difficult for them to give the model to someone else since the other engineer maybe didn't use the same tool that they used. Now that a lot of our engineers are using uh, Modelica, it's much easier. So we can take a model from one team and deliver it to another team and they can start using it within hours. So pretty easy. Great. And we actually have time for one last question that just came in okay. and then after this we'll move on to the technical demo. Um, but Praveen R asks, how satisfied are you with your vehicle dynamics model in Modelon? Is there something you would like to improve? Uh, we are very satisfied with our vehicle dynamics model in uh, vehicle dynamics library. We're using it as the reference for uh, building our control algorithm. And we're also using it as the thing that we're testing all of our vehicle dynamics maneuver against before we have a mule vehicle that we can validate, uh, validate uh, against the model. So we trust it pretty, pretty much, uh, and I can't wait to see what the validation results show. Thank you, Kruno, and thank you to everybody that uh, submitted a question. If we didn't get to your question, um, we'll address it offline. Uh, now, with that uh, being said, we will now move on to Eric Derling, a simulation engineer from Modelon. Eric, you have the floor. Thank you, Swati. Uh, and thank you, Kruno. Hello, everyone. My name is Erik Durling. I'm uh, one of the developers of the electrification library by Modlon. Um, and I've also been involved in numerous service projects and research projects, uh, um, primarily with automotive customers. Um, and originally, I have a Master of Science in Systems Control and Mechatronics. So as Kruna told you earlier, um, the upcoming release of the electrification library will include some examples from our collaboration with Remats. So this includes a detailed battery model of the Remats R&D battery um, and a couple of uh, battery experiments, including validation data. And uh, this is also using the new battery cycler component. Um, these examples will be part of the 1.2 release of the electrification library that will be available in early July. So this is the 1.2 version of the library. So now I will show you these examples and I will demonstrate how you can, how we can go from simulating a single battery cell to a full electric vehicle. So let me open up Dimola here. So this is a common software for uh, modeling and simulation with the Modelica language. And to the left here, we see the package browser. And this shows all the model libraries that I have loaded here. So for example, the Modelica standard library and uh, the electrification library by Modelon, which is the focus of this demo. This is uh, an early version that you're seeing here of the upcoming 1.2 version of the library. And uh, this includes the examples from our collaboration with Remats. And you find them here in the batteries package, examples, and here's the Remats package. And uh, here is a is the the uh, the model of the battery cell that Kruno mentioned, and there is also uh, a battery module and a package with 
the two experiments that I will show you. So let's start by looking at the cell test experiment. I'll open this up. So this here is an experiment with a single battery cell. And the purpose of this test is to validate the battery cell model before we scale it up to a full battery pack and system level simulations. And this cell model is separated into an electric part, the core, and a thermal part. The core model describes the electrical dynamics of the battery and you find this in the package here called cell 21700. Let's open up the core model here, just quickly go into it and we see that this is an equivalent circuit model made up of standard components from the library. Um, in this cell 21700 package you also find a voltage and impedance model of this cell that is used in the core model. And these are parameterized based on actual lab data by Remats. Let me go back up into the cell experiment, the cell test experiment here. The core model depends on temperature. So we simulate this together with a model of the thermal dynamics of the cell as well. And you find this thermal model also here in the cell package next to the core model. So in this experiment, we are discharging and charging the cell according to a recorded current cycle that we see here. And we also included measurements of the corresponding lab tests for comparison, uh, corresponding uh, measurements from, from, from a lab test of voltage and temperature for comparison. Um, and I've already run this simulation, so I'll just open up the results so we can see them. At the top here, we see the cell current that we're uh, that is following the pre-recorded cycle. And as a result, we can see the cell voltage uh, changes due to the impedance and the change in state of charge, which we see in the following plot here. And the last plot, we see the surface temperature of the cell. And we can see uh, both in the voltage and the temperature plots here, we have included the lab measurements for voltage and temperature, and we can see a good match uh, with reference. So now that we have a validated cell model, we want to use this in a battery pack consisting of multiple cells. So let me switch to the module test here, which is also part of the upcoming library release. And in this experiment, we see a Remats battery module here which is electrically connected to this load here. We can also note this dotted line, um, which is a control bus that we use for providing sensor data from the battery to the load. And you find the model of this battery module, you find it here in the module package, right here. And if we open this up, we see that in, it includes, um, we see that we, we can recognize the core model here um, of the 21700 cell that we tested in the previous experiment. And we can see that this is configured to use uh, 24 cells in series and 10 in parallel. So we have a total of 240 cells in this battery module. And uh, we can also see an electrical domain model here that describes how the cells are connected together. And uh, we have the thermal model here of the whole battery module. Uh, and if we open up that one real quick, we see we also recognize the thermal model of the battery cell that we had in the previous experiment, in addition to additional thermal dynamics of the battery module itself. And uh, this thermal model of the battery module, you will find also in this module package next to the, the battery module itself. Here's the thermal model. Let's go back to the module test. And uh, we see that the battery module is connected to the battery cycler load here. So this is a new component included in the 1.2 release of the 
electrification library. Um, the purpose of this component is to perform tests with batteries um, that do not have a BMS controller uh, that ensures limits of the battery are expected. Um, we can also note here that uh, this example includes thermal boundary conditions in the form of uh, environment temperature and uh, also cell cooling. And whoops, now we lost the screen here. Let me just open it up again. All right. So here, yeah, right, the cell cooling here. And for modeling, uh, the cooling uh, of, uh, of batteries remats are using the liquid cooling library by Modelon. Um, that library is not used in this example. Um, so if you're interested, uh, we would be happy to provide you with separate examples that combine the electrification library with the liquid cooling library. So please contact you, contact us if you're interested in this. Let's have a look at the simulation results here. And uh, at the top, we see the reference power in light green here, and we see the actual power output of the battery. Um, and we also see the power limit of the battery cycler. And we can, uh, we can see that uh, the limit drops here at the end, limiting the power output of the battery. And we can see here in the next plot, we see the state of charge and we notice why the power drops. It's because the state of charge reaches the lower boundary that we've set for the battery cycler. We've also included uh, plots of the battery voltage and battery cell temperature during the experiment here at the end. I won't go into more details of the results here, but you will find more information about these examples in the included documentation with the release. Um, so these two examples only covered battery components. So the real power of these multi-physics models comes when we integrate them into a larger system. So let me wrap up this demo with a quick look into a full vehicle model. So here we have combined the electrification library with the vehicle dynamics library by Modlin. This is a separate example not included in the electrification library. Um, so in this example, we have a full vehicle model and the driver um, that performs a handling maneuver with this vehicle. If you look into the vehicle model, we see that there is a model of the brake system we have a chassis model and we have a powertrain model here. Let's look into the powertrain model and we see that this is an electric powertrain where we have an electric machine for each of the four wheels. We also see that this is connected to a battery pack here. And uh, this is based on the, the Remats battery core model that, we, that I showed you before. Looking into the parameters of this one, we see that it has 200 cells in, in series. So this actually has 2000 cells instead of the 240 that was in the previous example. We can also note that there is a system controller here connected to the components um, that listens to the limits reported by the battery pack controller and allocates power to each of the electric machines based on the driver inputs. Um, I won't have time to go into more details of this example in the demo, but if you're interested in obtaining examples where we show you uh, how we combine the electrification library with the, the vehicle dynamics library or the liquid cooling library, don't hesitate to contact us. So you should now have an idea of how you can go from single battery cell testing to a full battery pack and what it might look like when this is integrated in a full vehicle model. Thank you so much for listening. I will now hand over to Swati for the following Q&A. Thanks, Eric. Uh, with that, we'll take questions on this demo or the components specifically. So I have one question that came in. Um, is electrification library compatible with Open Modelica? And if not, why? So 
we have not done any verification specifically for the open uh, open Modelica uh, environments. Um, all of our libraries uh, are intended to be compatible with Modelica uh, in large. So our intention is that we should support uh, all Modelica tools that fully support the standard. Um, at the moment, uh, the 1.2 version of, of the release uh, has been primarily verified with uh, Daimola, but we are for the upcoming uh, um, uh, release in this uh, fall of, of 2019. So we will uh, we are doing uh, an extended uh, verification with other Modelica tools uh, as well. So. Uh, um, if you are uh, using other Modelica tools, uh, the upcoming release this autumn uh, should uh, uh, should su should be supported in 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 general Modelica language tools. Thank you for the question and thanks, Eric. Um, our next question is from Chad Baker. Can any of this demo stuff be provided? It'd be great to play around with. Right. So the both of the two. First uh, models uh, that I showed you is included in the upcoming 1.2 release of the electrification library that will be available early July. Uh, so both of those two models, uh, if you have the library, you can, or if you have an evaluation license of the library, you can play around with those models and look into them. Um, the last example that I showed you with the vehicle dynamics library, um, we can provide you with uh, such a system example if you contact us, uh, but it's not the, the combination of the two libraries is not included in the, as an example in the library. Thanks for the question, Chad. Our next question is from Vignesh. Um, is EL compatible with Modelon's OCT compiler and is it validated? Uh, is, is what compatible? Uh, electrification library. Oh. Right, so that's that's the uh, that's the work that we're doing for the release coming up this fall um, to to ensure that all of the parts of the library is compatible with the OCT compiler. Um, right now, there are some known issues that uh, uh, that we are working on addressing. Um, so we are doing a thorough thorough testing with the OCT compiler for for the fall release. Thanks for the question, Vignesh. Um, our next question is from Siddharth Arun Kumar. During the thermal correlation phase with test data, do we manually change model parameters or is there a way for Modelica to optimize parameters by itself for the best curve fit? Um, the short answer is yes, it's possible to do those kind of optimization with Modelica, but uh, it depends a lot on the workflow you have employed. Um, we don't have any um, data fitting uh, support in the electrification library specifically. Um, so so uh, at the moment, uh, if you want to do that, you would have to set up those workflows separately. But uh, Modelic in itself is very well suited for doing uh, uh, model optimization, um, but uh, it, it depends on the workflow that you would like to employ. Thank you for the question, Siddharth. Um, our next question is from Maurice Bashir Parambu. Um, do you have a physics-based battery model in your library? Um, when you say physics-based, I'm assuming you mean uh, where, you, where you describe the, the chemistry of the of the battery cells, uh, like, uh, and uh, at the moment, the only examples we include are equivalent circuit models. Um, the whole battery module models, uh, uh, sorry, the the architecture for the battery module models are uh, created in a modular way, so that you, if you have uh, an electrochemical model that you would like to include, uh, you can basically extend the existing interfaces, which are all open. Um, so that you, if you have your model, you can, you can use those interfaces to put your cell model in there and use that in the battery packs and 
in the full system models if you want to. So it's all based on open interfaces, so you can extend it and add more detailed models. But uh, currently, no, we don't. We only have uh, uh, equivalent circuit models. Thank you for the question, Rais. Um, it looks like we have another question rolling in. Um, do you consider HVAC modeling, modeling within your full vehicle simulation? In the examples that I showed you right here, um, there, uh, there, was, we did, there was no cooling in that specific model if that's what you're talking about. Um, but uh, this is definitely uh, an important use case, being able to do thermal, thermal management simulations. Um, uh, for example, coupling with liquid cooling library by modeling. Uh, so the full, uh, all of the electrification library is built to support thermal interfaces everywhere so that you can couple it with cooling, cooling system models. Um, that's an important use case. Thank you for your question, Vincenzo. Um, we have another question from Thomas. Well, um, I'm not sure though if the question was about uh, cooling and air conditioning. Maybe it was uh, alternating currents the question was about. Um, and uh, I can, I can <laughs> mention, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> so I can mention that uh, the focus of the library at the moment has been on the DC part of the system and um, the alternating currents between inverters and machines is, uh, is uh, bundled and generalized. Uh, uh, so if you want to study the alternating currents, three-phase currents between machines and inverters, um, you would have to include uh, uh, component models from additional libraries and bundle that with the electrification library. Uh, which is perfectly possible. Um, we might include some examples of interfaces for uh, to support this uh, connection and bundling in a future version, but currently the focus is on the DC system model. Um, yeah. Great. Thanks, Eric. Um, we have time for questions from two more people. Um, one is from Thomas Hoffman. He asks, is cycling and calendric aging included in the battery models? We have uh, one example of, uh, of aging model included in the library, um, uh, both cal calendar and, 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 and cyclic aging. Um, it's one example. Um, it, you can uh, extend the interfaces again if you have a different model that you would like to include. Um, but yes, there is, there is, uh, there is one example of, of, of this in the library. Thank you for your question, Thomas. Um, and then last question, um, do you have electrothermal network model for discretized battery module, pack module, and with how many cells and how many variants are provided? Oh, that was a big question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Electrothermal models. Um, so we have, I'm not sure if I understand the question correctly, but um, so we have, for example, the, uh, the example that I showed you with the cell model, um, that thermal model of the cell uh, can be discretized uh, by slicing it and you can have considered uh, uh, the heat transfer from the core of the model to the surface of the cell. Um, you can also, when you put the battery cell models into a full battery pack, um, you could use uh, either individual uh, thermal nodes for each battery cell, or you could also use a lumped version where you uh, either calculate the whole battery pack as a single thermal, cell, uh, thermal uh, mass, or you can uh, use uh, a battery cell model to calculate only a single cell and then scale that up uh, to represent all of the cells in the battery. So there's a lot of um, freedom in, 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 in how you discretize uh, thermal models of the battery packs. Um, but again, this is, a, this is an area where there is a lot of custom designs. Uh, different uh, customers have different technical solutions for their 
uh, thermal designs. And for that reason, it's important that uh, the customer can include their own thermal models or adapt and modify the existing ones. Um, so we've created the thermal models as uh, basic examples and we more or less assume that the customer would, uh, would extend and modify these further to represent their specific design. Thank you, Eric, and thank you for the question. Um, that's all the time we have today. If you did ask a question and we did not get to it, um, we'll reach out to you offline. Uh, but with that, uh, we'll just do the closeout. Um, so thank you again for attending this webinar. If you have any questions about ModelOn, um, you can visit www.modelon.com or contact us at sales at modelon.com. Um, if you would like to contact Kruno or Eric offline, you can contact them through the contact information shown below. Again, this will be um, shared, the recording will be shared to everybody who attended. Um, and with that, again, I wanna thank Kruno and Eric for being here, and I wanna thank all of you for tuning in and hope to see you at the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you everyone for listening. Thank you, Swati. Thank you, Kruno.